I'd like to begin our my discourse or, uh, of our satsang this evening with a reading from Whispers from Eternity. And in this, it master is entitled this one, A Prayer for Devotion. O oh, Father, let me hold my heart in my folded hands. Teach me to saturate my prayers with thy love. Give me the simple, sincere devotion of a child toward thee. Teach me to realize thy nearness behind the voice of my prayer. Teach me to realize thy breath in my own breathing. Teach me to feel thee in my emotion. Teach me to know that thy wisdom is in my understanding. Teach me to feel thine all-pervading life in my life. Flood my senses with thy light. Commonly understood, I think we, you know, everybody prays. And, I, and it's understood to be, in a sense, you could say, if we have a sense of belief in God and have a guru, we, you could say it's a, a calling of the heart, and it must be of the heart, not just of the mind. A calling of the heart to God. To come, you know, it's that sense of wanting God to come to us, that there be union with that highest uh, self of, uh, of which we're capable of. And just like we began our meditation with, reveal thyself, reveal to myself, come out of the darkness. We're wanting to unite our little self with that higher self. And in one fashion or another, you could say everybody prays, but it's not always on that level of calling to God. I remember when I was a young man, before I really came onto this path, I used to talk to myself, and, I, and uh, there was always a conversation going in my mind, and I would be commenting on, you know, to, on one thing or another mentally, and I think we all do this. And one day, and this was after I came onto the spiritual path and uh, had read the autobiography of a yogi, I was considering, I saw this happening within myself, and I asked myself, who am I talking to? And I couldn't answer the question. I says, well, I'm talking to myself. But I says, no, if, I, if that's it, I'm not talking to my normal self. I'm talking to my higher self. It's as, as if there was this higher self looking down at me, and I was commenting it. Well, I got myself into another fix. Now, how am I going to get out of this? And, gee, I really I hope this happens. Or I hope that happens. And I was broadcasting this out into the universe, and I began to realize, maybe that's what God is somehow there, and maybe that's what prayer is. Now, that was very a rough uh, approximation of prayer because was, there was no concentration to it or no focus to it and I didn't really direct it to anything particularly but it gave me a taste of maybe that's what people do when they pray because I didn't pray when I was young I, it wasn't a concept for me too much I knew about it but I can't say that I actively engaged in it other than this and slowly I began to formulate an idea within myself that's that calling, especially as I began to meditate, I began to study these teachings, I, be, I realized that all the teachings say the first thing we have to do is to awaken the love of the heart and that yearning of what is it that we're really yearning for. Now, most people, you could say the day-to-day, -day, we're praying for things of this world. We want uh, food and shelter, and we want company, and we want uh, success in our marks in school, and we want we want a new house, a bigger car, we want a relationship with somebody. We're we're yearning for something outside of ourselves, but behind it all, if we are intuitive and can discern, we see that there's something else behind it, and we're yearning for that. And devotion is the calling of that, and you could say prayer is the manifestation of that active manifestation of calling to God for, really, what we're calling for is God himself, herself, Divine Mother, to come to us. But we, it's filtered down, and it's that, but it's that calling that forms the basis of what prayer is and the enthusiasm of that and the emotion that we can put into it. 
turning that emotion into devotion for it. And so we slowly, naturally, without thinking of it even in a religious sense, it's a natural impulse of the heart. They say that there are, there are no atheists in a foxhole during wartime because, of course, you know, the bombs are falling. And the natural impulse is to call to a higher power. And it's that appeal to the higher power that forms the substance of what prayer is. And we can't leave it at that. Now the devotee begins to learn. We're calling and we're calling and we're calling. And what do the great ones tell us? There comes a point when we need to listen as well. So you could say the listening of what's God's response to us or what's the universe's response to it, or if you care to say our highest self, that conscience of the higher con superconsciousness, what is it trying to tell us in response to that call? And that's what we do when we meditate, is we begin to listen. So the two are complementary, and for success on the spiritual path as a disciple and as a devotee, it's very critical that we have both. We need to have the calling of the heart. As Master would say, he says, whip up devotion. Now, he didn't say whip up emotion, he said whip up devotion, because emotion is the stimulating of the senses and of the heart's feelings and pointing them outward through the senses. And it becomes the ups and downs of emotional reaction to daily life. But if we stir up that feeling of the heart and inwardly direct it upward, and so pray, so they get that feeling going in the heart and direct it upward the spiritual eye and broadcast it out from there, out into the universe and calling to God. And we find that in that practice, then we listen and we, in the heart, begin to feel. And with the use of our intuition, we begin to feel a response. Now, a lower octave of that is when we pray. I've mentioned that, well... What do people normally pray for? They pray for these things outwardly. And it's easy for somebody like myself to sort of downplay that. Oh, that's not good. But it's not, that, that's okay. Because Master said, we should be like a child and ask God to provide for us as his children. And his children need to have the basics of this life. Ask for God for those. And yes, sometimes we ask for useless things, but even that, it's not bad to do that. The important thing is when we do that, it's better to do that than to think solely that through my will alone, I have accomplished all that I've accomplished in life. And if I want a new car through my will, I will gain that car. Now, that's fine up to a point. But if we can bring God into the picture too, to realize that all things in this life, the, the world around us, everything has a divine source. And so to pray and bring that element into us, yes, maybe it's a lower prayer, but it teaches us. It teaches us to call upon God for everything until ultimately we're satisfied with whatever God brings into us in, in answer of that. Master would say that, and this is what all the great ones, he says, pray, but then... You could say, qualify that, pray. Thy, you know my needs, Lord. Thy will be done. And this, of course, is what Christ's prayer in, before he was crucified. He didn't want to be crucified. He saw that coming. He said, let this cup pass to God when he was praying. He says, but thy will be done, not mine. And to be able to surrender ourselves in self-offering and then Asking for that union with God is what the important thing is. And then if you have that union, you can ask God for anything. And God will supply. Or not, maybe, if it's not in your best interest. You know best, Lord. Uh, there's a, in years ago, uh, 1970s, I guess it was, there was a president of the United States named, uh, name was Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter was a was a, a very nice man, as in terms of in, integrity as a, as a president. And uh, he served for four years. And but he had he was also a pastor or a minister 
reverend in his church. He was a very you know, church-going man. And he said, God will answer all prayers. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. And sometimes he says, you got to be kidding. <laughs> and when we, and when we, but directing our prayers to God forms that good habit to bring God into all transactions of our life starting our meals with the prayer, you know, starting our day with the prayer, starting our meditation with the prayer, starting meetings with the prayer. Bring that habit into your life, and you'll see you include God into everything that you're doing. But people pray, and they say, well, it doesn't do any good. Well, usually it's because most people's prayers are simply lackluster. They're just, they're just on the surface of their consciousness. They don't, they're not uh, uh, very... Now, they're not deep. It's like that one uh, man that uh, uh, he, was a, he was a monk or maybe he was a priest. I don't remember. Uh, master was uh, asked him, he says, do you ever, see, you know, have any inward experiences like perhaps see lights or hear sounds or God speak to you in some way or an angelic presence? And the man, you know, very piously, he said, no, I, I have not had that grace. God has not given that to me. But when God chooses, he will give me. That will come. And Ma Master said, no, that's not right. He says, the reason those things have not come to you is because your devotion is lackluster. And you have to have that devotional quality, prayerful quality, and the complementary listening, and to go deep until you forget the little self and in that self-offering in prayer, then God responds. Now, I want to read something that Master said, though, because, um, you know, because most people's prayers are not really very deep. It's mostly wishful thinking or hopeful thinking. And although uh, it's, a good effort, it's a good gesture, but it doesn't go deep enough. And this is why he's saying it doesn't, it, they don't get answered. He says, an unceasing demand for anything mentally whispered with unfleeching zeal and unflagging courage and faith develops into a dynamic power which so influences the, the entire behavior of conscious, subconscious, and superconscious powers of man that the desired object is gained now, he's not referencing here to God, but he's making, make, you might say he's saying a call for something to the universe itself. And of course, he means God. A mental whisper to achieve its object must be undaunted by reverses and unceasing in its inner performance. Then it will materialize. And this is how we must bring to uh, our quality we must bring to, pair, to our prayers, that unceasing calling. There's a wonderful story you'll remember from the autobiography of a yogi where Master is about to embark for the United States and he wants assurance that he's not going to be lost in the ocean of materialism of the West and that he's doing the right thing by going. Even though his guru has told him to go, he knows it's right intellectually, but he wants that reassurance in the heart. And so he prays to Baba, Babaji. He's at his home, Karpar Road, and he goes, he prays, and he prays, and hours go by. And he said he prayed to the point where he felt that his skull was going to crack. Now, think of that. His skull was going to crack. And at that instant, when he was just about at the end of his limits, there was a knock on the door, and Babaji was there at the doorway and came and reassured him, answered his prayer. And if we want our prayers to be answered, we have to have that, that willpower, that concentration, but that fervor of the heart. And I think this, on the spiritual path, this is probably the most important element. Master would often tell Swami Kriyananda, he says, you must get devotion, you're so dry. 
get devotion because we won't succeed unless we have that devotional fervor. And it seems like it's an inevitable battle for every devotee to be able to keep that enthusiasm up and keep it from slipping down into a spiritual indifference. And because when it does, that's when your, your, your spiritual life begins to lag, begins to wander, you begin to plateau that indifference begins to uh, come in and you begin to lose that enthusiastic fervor. So keeping that fervor up is the primary requisite to the spiritual path. And you, many ways to do that, of course, it's just a continual prayer, the continual you know, calling to God, summoning it up, the devotion, chanting is half the battle, as Paramahansa Yogananda would say, singing, putting yourself in the right environment. But it does take that effort of will to keep your devotional fervor up. And prayer is a, an essential, I would say, ingredient of that, that calling of the heart to receive. And God responds. And you can, you know, he responds, she responds uh, to the sincere devotee. Now, there is that story, I'm sure, or that image that is often used with uh, prayer to the Divine Mother. It says, the Divine Mother is like a mother with a child. It is the baby cries and cries and cries. And you give the child a toy and the child satisfies and stops crying. And the mother can go about her work. He says, but then sometimes the baby will not be satisfied until the mother picks the child up. And he says, that's how we want to be. We want to be like the naughty baby that's not going to be satisfied with toys anymore. And so consequently, to pray for God's presence for the devotee is really what we want to do. Now, God will see to our needs. But... Pray as a child would pray to God because we are God's children. And as God's children, God will see to our needs. God will give us those things materially. And if we have God's presence within it, really, we don't really care so much for how that needs are satisfied because that in and of itself is completely satisfying to be when we actually... Uh, when we ha we actually have God and, and we, we have God's presence. But I think one of the most practical ways that prayer manifests in our life is yeah, for things we want, or we, we want healing, we want uh, good health, we want these types of things, and that's, that's fine. But the day-to-day, -day, almost daily, we always are praying, I think, for guidance. I know I am. I'm wondering, now what am I going to do? You know, what's the next step I need to take? How should I, how should I go about? Uh, I'm a problem solver type person, and so I'm solving problems in my own life, trying to go forward with my life, and how can I do this better? How can I, what might I do to be able to improve my meditation, or how can I please you, God? And These sorts of things, it's in a sense a prayer for guidance in life. And... Sometimes those things, and for most cases, and certainly in my life, it's, it's somewhat trivial things, but it stimulates a conversation with God. Okay, God, I'm, you're my partner in life, and I keep asking, talking to you. So instead of thinking of, I'm solving all these problems, I recommend very much that we go through life with God as our constant companion. Be, let God be the one that we're continually having a dialogue with. And in a sense, we're never alone that way. I think loneliness is not possible if you have God in your life because uh, you can, and then you see everybody who comes in, other people, they be, they're in a sense, God's in them keeping you company. But even when they're not there, you still always have that divine presence with, uh, with you, with us. And so, Try that, but we are looking for guidance in life. And I think in a sense, this is a, an important question for us. How do we, how do we get that guidance? Because what do we do? That's, those questions face us so often. The important thing is to first calm yourself, 
Make yourself calm. The motions of the heart are good. You know that old saying that the mind follows the heart. Guidance, we want guidance, but the heart is saying, what do I really, I want this, I really want that, I want that. And they want confirmation, you might say, divine confirmation of my likes and dislikes, my whims and fancies, as Master says in the autobiography of Yogi. We have to, one, calm the heart. Get that heart very still to the point of neutrality, in a sense. And then in our aspiration of desire, where, what should I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? And you can actually hold up to, the, up to God, hold up to my Divine Mother, this alternative, or perhaps that alternative, or just some getting, asking for intuitive guidance and broadcast that out from the spiritual eye very strongly, in the, in, sort of in accordance here with what Master said with fervor, broadcast, I need an answer, I need an answer. Now, my, my practice is, is when I need an answer, I, I tend to, not so much, it's, I don't know why this is, but I don't ask Master, I don't ask Sri Teshwar, I ask Babaji. I says, Babaji, I need an answer. It's like he's the Maha Guru, Maha Avatar. I broadcast to Babaji, you have to answer. And then, immediately after, go into the heart and feel intuitively, what should I do? And look for an answer. And oftentimes, a, a thought, just a flicker will pass through, and I grab it and I follow it and see. But you have to be—you have to be in a state of neutrality, of not, you know, I want—I really, really this is really I want, and you know, but and just be open, and your intuition in time will grow, and you'll begin to have a flicker, and then you follow that flicker and you blow a little on it, and it begins to go into flame, and you get an idea. May not be a full blown answer, but it'll give you a certain direction. But even if you don't get that, it's okay. The important thing is to ask. There was a story that Swami Kriyananda, it's one of his letters or books of letters, I don't remember where, but somebody wrote to a woman, I believe it was, wrote to him and said, I have a very important decision to make in my life, and I have I have two alternatives. And this is very important for my future. Should I do this or should I do that? And uh, I need to have this answer soon. What should I, but I, I pray and I pray and I cannot get an answer one way or the other. What do I do? And Swami wrote her back, he says, don't worry about it. It does not matter which one of these you do. The important thing is that you've asked for, for an answer. And so consequently, if you ask in devotion and with a pure desire to serve and to do the right thing, it does not matter if you do this one or you do that one. Some, see, sometimes we think that God's will is immutably in this direction, and if I don't do that direction, I'm somehow doing something that's not God's will. Well, God's will doesn't work that way. It's all God's will. Yes, it's true. If we attune ourselves, there are levels of attunement. But if we, if it's, we can't discern that, do the best thing possible. And Swami gave a good piece of advice. If you can't know which direction to go, choose that direction which brings you to an increasing feeling of inner joy. What brings inner joy? And go in that direction and you'll find that if you follow that like a string, it'll take you out of the labyrinth. Ultimately, of course, we want to have that attunement and it depends on the consciousness and within which we ask God. If we are in a state of grace, if we're in a state of deep peace, if we're in a state of calmness, if we're in a state of joy, if we ask in that state, we're going to receive God's answer that is informed by that state. And the more we are in a God, godly state, the more our guidance will be pure and in tune, purely with God's will. And so this is our job. You could say, and this is why when Master told Oliver Black, said, Oliver, do you pray? And Oliver said, 
Master, I'd like to think I pray uh, all the time. And Master said, no, you pray to God. You should pray in God. In other words, put yourself in a God, godly state, a God-conscious state, in a deep state of God-attunement. And in that state, ask God for what you need. You need an answer. You need guidance. You need attunement. You need more devotion. You need an answer to help something. It's not for the little you know, uh, toys of this world. But ask for, ask for what you need. Really, God, I'm your child. You know, you know what I need. Supply whatever you think is best for me. And in that consciousness of prayer, you'll find if you're in that godly, and do, a godly state, you will purely be, God will take care of everything for you, even in the details of your life. And so make God, I think, if I conclude here, make God your companion in life. Have a conversation with him. Have an ongoing conversation. He's right there with you at all times. God, what should we do about this? Guide me in this. And you might say, then go forward. God, what do we do about this? Master, what do we do? And if you go through life in that, you're going to find that whether you go left or right probably is not going to matter as long as God and gurus are with you. They'll protect you. And they'll lead you perhaps by a winding road, but they'll lead you ultimately to your destination. Much joy to you. Uh, Bara, if you're there behind the scenes, I'll, I'll ask you if there are any uh, concluding announcements or um, instructions that you want to give. And... Uh, this time. Jayaji, this is Ashish here. Oh, it's Ashish. It's not Bara. Okay. No, we, she change, we interchange shapes sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> think, yeah, that was all. I think thank you very much for this wonderful morning that you've given us. Yes. Okay. Well, if, we, if there's nothing further, then what I'd like to do is let's conclude with the healing prayer, asking God to, to bless us and let's send this this vibration of God attunement out into the world. So let's pray together. Divine Mother, great masters, saints of all religion, we are thy, thy children, we are thy disciples. May we feel thy presence within our hearts and may thy blessings flow through us to reach out to souls everywhere. Let's rub our hands together, send out three ohms to the world. Oh, oh. Joy to everyone.